very accurate accounts out about what happened in Azusa Street. It was quite supernatural, quite phenomenal, Amen. and quite God. Amen. Well, sometimes that actually happens here in our services. We've, we've experienced the, uh, I mean, we sing in tongues often, you know, a time of worshiping the Lord in tongues or in the spirit, however you want to say it, or maybe with your understanding, you're just singing your own song, which is fine as well. But sometimes it's the Holy Spirit kind of just takes over. It just all of a sudden there's a different level. Mm -hmm. A different level of the presence of God. Mm -hmm. I really like those times. Yes. And I literally will drive a thousand miles to be in, into that. <clears throat> I've done that several times. Well, it happened here Sunday. Sunday morning. <coughs> It was a particular time in our worship after we've been worshiping for quite a while. <clears throat> All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was taking over. How many of you recognize that? How many of you recognize that Sunday morning when it happened? Well, that's a time then to really lean into God, to really look to Him, really invite His presence in your own life. You may be singing in your understanding, or you may be singing in tongues, but be aware of the fact that something's happening in the spirit realm, and enter into it. And don't do anything to mess it up. It might last five minutes, it might last much longer. But it's not a time to start a song, it's not a time to lead in a prayer, it's not a time to prophesy, it's a time to just wait in His presence. Maybe you're, maybe you're singing, maybe you're speaking in tongues, or maybe whatever. Maybe you're just quietly meditating on the Lord. But don't do anything to break it up. Just allow it to happen. It, it'll, it'll lift us as suddenly as it came without anybody doing anything. It happened Sunday morning. It was here. Several weeks ago, I was in another place, another state, and they had, you know, they had a good worship team and a lot of people were in attendance. Several thousand people were in attendance, and all of a sudden it just happened. All across the whole place, everybody was just worshiping the Lord. And they knew how to let it happen, and it happened for about 20 minutes. I've been in other places where it's happened, and it's happened for 35 or 40 minutes. But it's just a wonderful thing to be in the presence of God, just to realize that His presence has come in a different dimension, a different anointing, a different level. And you know what? That's a time when people can be healed. Without anybody praying for healing or anybody doing anything, just worshiping the Lord, people can be healed. Not only healed of sicknesses, but healed of, of fear or unbelief or anger or whatever. Just something happens. It's God. He's come and He's with His people. He's enjoying the presence of His people and He's enjoying their worship. I hope I'm not spooking you out by talking this way. You know our God's a supernatural God? Yes. <clears throat> and He's living in us, as was mentioned. But we don't, we don't worship the God inside of us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We worship the God in heaven, Amen. our Father in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ. And... It's a wonderful thing to experience God's presence. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I was going to speak a few minutes about David. <clears throat> Let's turn to 1 Samuel in chapter 17. Well, he, he learned out there 
on the hillsides in the evenings and nights, and probably the daytime too. He learned that as he played the harp and worshiped God, that God's presence would come on him. And he, he liked that. He liked that feeling, that sensing that the creator of the universe was there on him, with him, fellowshipping with him, protecting him, giving him power, ability, taking away all fear, gave him courage. It takes a lot of courage to face a bear or a lion barehanded, which he did do. <coughs> and he, he beat him. I mean, it says, it says here in, here in uh, 17, verse 36, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. <laughs> he, he loved the presence of God. And uh, he, he experienced that he had authority, power, ability, whatever, when, when the presence of God was with him. And so as he goes out to take some food to his brothers, who were in the army, and he finds out that there's a Goliath out there on the other side of this hill or valley, whatever, wherever it was, how it was set up. Two lines of battle. One line of battle was Israel, and the other was the Philistines. And Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. You know the story, of course. It's one of the first things you ever learned in Sunday school was a little kid, David and his slingshot. Um, he he realized that this guy was cursing God. He was cursing the God that he was in relationship with. Now, it's kind of, it's kind of a little bit of a mix-up here as you read the story, because David has, has already been anointed to be king in a way, but a secret anointing. Uh, Samuel had chosen him, God had chosen him, and Samuel had worked his way through and finally found the right one and poured the horn on him with oil. In effect, he was anointing him to be the next king. Because God told Samuel, he said, I found a man after my own heart. I'm, I'm tired of Saul. He's disobeyed me and so forth. And so David knew that this God whom he worshipped and whom he, he knew quite well, he experienced his power, his ability, his fellowship, he knew that this God of his fathers, the God of Israel, had selected him to be king. Now, I don't know how he dealt with that in his mind. You know, I can't imagine a teenager working this through his mind, that he's going to be the next king. But he knew he was going to be the next king. He was sure of that. So, therefore, he knew that Goliath was not going to kill him, because he hadn't been king yet. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and also, he knew that he was in fellowship with God through the covenant of circumcision. He was an Israelite, and that he had been circumcised the eighth day, and which ratifies the covenant that God made with Abraham, and so forth. And now he's in the covenant relationship. He knows that he's in the covenant relationship. And he knows that Goliath is not in the covenant relationship. And he never ever called him Goliath. He only just called him an uncircumcised Philistine. Uh -huh. he's, I think he called him that three times. Because he's saying, in effect, he's not in the covenant. I'm in the covenant. He's not in the covenant. I'm going to win. It was just that, just that simple to him. He had absolute total faith he was going to win. He had no doubt he was going to win. He didn't know how he was going to kill him. Was he going to kill him with a sword or with the, the stick he had or the sling? He, he wasn't even concerned about that. He knew he was going to kill him. He figured out the sword wasn't going to work because all this stuff was too heavy to wear. And so he took his little staff and his sling, and then he decided to just kill him with a sling. I guess otherwise he just punched his eyes out with the staff. I don't, I don't know how he was going to do it, but he knew he was going to do it. <laughs> 